test. Good morning, everybody, and we'd like to welcome you to our live stream service from the Apostolic Cornerstone Church, uh, located currently in Jericho, Vermont, on Route 15. And we appreciate all of those that are tuning in today to uh, take part in the worship service with us. Uh, just a quick announcement. We are trying to work with both federal and state guidelines on how to open up the church, reopen up the church. It's going to look very different from what it was before. And we are just asking your patience with the process. Uh, Pastor McAllister is working very hard to stay abreast of current uh, regulations. And just, uh, just a heads up that it's not going to look like it did back before we stopped meeting together. So your patience, your prayers are appreciated in all of that. We are going to work today with trying to get songs up on the screen. Again, this is all a work in progress. We are learning as we go. We are tweaking sound. We are learning about uh, how to put songs up. And again, we appreciate your patience with this as we try to um, get our, our uh, for lack of a better word, our technique perfected for the live stream service. And people are working very hard, uh, Brother Chanin, Brother Nate, uh, Brother Jason Zider, all working very hard to provide you as good a quality a live stream as we can. So, with that said, let's uh, all get together and we will open with a worship song today and we'll go into our worship service. Mercy. Just one more time. Come into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for He is worthy, worthy of all our praise. He's worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. 
Welcome into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. No, He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. Well, make a melody, sing unto the Lord. He has given us a song and a sword, for He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. Make a melody. Sing unto the Lord, He has given us a song and a soul, for He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. For He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. Welcome into this house, magnify the Lord. Lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. For He is worthy, He's worthy of all our praise. God is the God of righteousness. God sits on the throne. God has gone battle. God is God alone. God is wise and merciful. God is a sovereign Lord. God is pure and holy. God reigns forevermore. Well, he's a great God, a righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God. We will proclaim honor and glory to his name. God holds up the universe, God sustains the soul, God exalts and God puts down, God is in control, God is love and peace, God is glory is eternal, God knows all, sees all is all, God is to be praised. For well, he's a great God, a righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God, we will proclaim honor and glory to his name. Well, God holds up the universe, God sustains his soul. God exalts and God puts down, God is in control. God's glory is eternal, God is love and peace. God knows all, sees all is all. God is to be praised. Well, he's a great God, a righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God, we will proclaim honor and glory to his name. He's a great God. A righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God, we will proclaim honor and glory to his name. God is a God of righteousness. God sits on the throne. God is strong in battle. God is God alone. God is wise and merciful. God is a sovereign Lord. God is pure and holy, God reigns forevermore. For he's a great God, a righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God, we will proclaim honor and glory to his name. He's a great God, a righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God, we will proclaim honor and glory to his name. Let's do it again. He's a great God, a righteous king, ruler over everything. He's a great God. We will proclaim honor and glory to his name. One more time. 
He's a great God, a righteous King, ruler over everything. He's a great God, we will proclaim honor and glory to His Don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than I Lead me to that rock Lead me to that rock Why don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than I Thou hast been a shelter for me Why don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than I Lead me to that rock Lead me to that rock, why don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than I, thou hast been a shelter for me. Let's do it again! Why don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than I, lead me to that rock, lead me to that rock, why don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than I. Thou hast been a shelter for me Why don't you lead me to that rock That is higher than I Lead me to that rock Lead me to that rock Why don't you lead me to that rock That is higher than I Thou hast been a shelter for me One more time Why don't you lead me to that rock that is higher than high. Lead me to that rock. Lead me to that rock. Why don't you lead me to that rock? That is higher than high. Thou hast been a shelter for me. Well, it's the old ship of Zion. It's hope for the lost and dying. It's a soul-saving station. The tower of salvation. It's the church triumphant, O oh Lord, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation. It's built on a rock. It's got a firm foundation. It's been through the flood. And it's been through the fire. But one of these days, the church got a Move up higher, it's a church triumphant, oh Lord. And it's built by the hand of the Lord. It's been through the storm, but the wind couldn't turn it. It's been in the fire, but the fire couldn't burn it. Fed to the lions, but the lions couldn't eat it. Fought a lot of war. But never defeated It's the church Triumphant, oh Lord And it's built By the hand of the Lord I'm talking about the church In the book of Revelation It's built on a rock It's got a firm foundation It's been through the flood it's been through the fire, but one of these days, the church gonna move up higher. It's a church, triumphant, oh Lord, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. Verse 2, it's been through the wind, but the wind couldn't turn it. It's been in the fire, but the fire couldn't burn it. Fed to the lions, but the lions couldn't eat it. Fought a lot of wars, 
but never defeated. It's a curse, something, oh Lord, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. Well, I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation. It's built on a rock, got a firm foundation. It's been through the flood. It's been through the fire, but one of these days, the church's gonna move up higher. It's the church, I'm fed, oh Lord, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. Well, I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation. It's built on the rock, it's got a firm foundation. It's been through the flood, and it's been through the fire, but one of these days, the church gonna move up higher. It's the church, triumphant, oh Lord, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. One more time in the chorus, I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation. It's built on a rock. Got a firm foundation. It's been through the fire, and it's been through the fire. But one of these days, the church's gonna move up higher. It's the church triumphant, oh Lord, and it's built by the hand of the Lord.
see you high in the air, shining in the light of your glory. For out your power and love, as we sing, holy, 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 high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. For out your power and love, as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Uh, Genesis 12 and 1 I will show you this is God he wants to show you and you can be seated where you are whenever God calls somebody to do something for him I want to tell you that it's a God sized directive meaning that you can't do it on your own you can't do it by yourself you don't have everything that you need in order to do it so what I'm saying is when God called you to do something, you're going to have to step out in faith in order to get it accomplished, and you're going to have to rely on God to show you exactly what things are going to be like. You don't know what things will be like from the very beginning. I've said this a few weeks back. It's like standing on the edge of the will of God and looking out into the will of God and trying to figure everything out before you do step out into the will of God. It never works that way. Even if you were to sit there and figure out all your plan from A to Z on stepping out into the will of God, I guarantee you that that's going to change after you step into the will of God because His will and our will do not match. His thoughts are beyond our thoughts. As I've said so many times, His thoughts, like the heavens are higher than the earth, His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are really beyond our understanding until we get into them. And then, probably, hindsight mostly. We look back and say, so that's what all this was about. But stepping into it is an act of faith. And faith is hoping that what is there is there, but not being able to see it not being able to sense it with our five senses, but stepping out in faith. Abram was told, you need to leave your country. You need to leave your family. You need to leave 
everything behind and just walk into a place where I will show you. But he didn't do that. Instead, he brought his father with him, Terah, and he brought his nephew Lot with him. They went to Haran, and then in Acts chapter 6, Stephen says that Terah's father died in Haran, and then Abram went down into Canaan. He said, I'm taking you from everything that's familiar and bringing you into a place that's not going to be familiar. I'm taking you out of everything that you've ever known, and when you get to where you're going, most of that is not going to apply. And I found out since being in the church that that is a true thing. It wasn't that I purposely dis dissed my friends. It was that they distanced themselves from me because I'm a new person now. I'm not living the old life that I used to live, and they don't understand that. Come to think of it, I didn't understand it either. But I got into it, and I just decided that this, this is right. If this is God, and he's done something for me that I've never had anybody anywhere ever do for me, this has got to be something. There's got to be something to this. So I step out into it, and it's so amazing that I didn't have to give up much of anything. It just kind of fell off as I move further into the will of God. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to take place. I didn't even know there was a Jericho, Vermont. Had no idea that the church, there was any church here. As a matter of fact, when I was 12 years old, I played Little League Baseball behind the church that used to be in Essex. That ball field's not in it there anymore. That church is not there anymore. But I was so close to where I was going to come in and be a part of this great church and didn't even realize it. Things in the future cannot be attained by standing where you are today. You've got to step out in faith. And as I've said so many times, our Christian walk is a walk of process and it's a walk of progress. So, just like Abram, Abram, you need to step out of the familiar. And he took that step, and God showed him where he needed to go. And after he took the next step, and finally went down into Canaan, then God spoke to him. We're not going to get any word from God just by staying where we are today. We're going to get a word from God as we progress more into his will. Then he starts talking to us a little bit more. If some people who are listening to this today feel like you haven't heard from God in a long time, you might want to just see if you've made any progress toward him in the last little bit of time in your life. Because I found out, and it's in the Bible, this is a biblical thing, that when you take a step toward God, you know he's taking a step toward you. He reveals more of himself to you. He reveals more of his will for your life to you. But you have to step. But when you do step, there's a time when you're just going to have to stand in that spot and be sensitive to the voice of God, hearing what he wants you to do. And in that spot, there is a process of development. You will develop, you will mature, and when you mature, you don't hear the voice of God anymore except him telling you, take the next step. I will show you what's next. I will show you what to do next. But you've got to step. And then when you take the next step, there's a time when you're going to develop that process. And then you're going to mature. And when you mature, you're going to have to take the next step. And the next, and the next. And it's always forward into the word and the will of God. And that's a kind of a disturbing thing because when you step out, all you've got is hope. Faith and hope. But thank God we've got a book that helps to guide us that's available to anybody. And when you start looking into that book, you'd be surprised at how complicated the mind of God really is. But when you step into it, you find out how simple this life becomes. It's a, it's a process. I went to the NASA website and on April 11th, 1970, they recorded the Apollo 13 mission. The Apollo 13 mission, three astronauts would go to the moon, land in a certain location, do their work, jump back up to the space capsule, shoot on back home, splash into the ocean, and then get a, a hero's parade down in New York City. Well, 200,000 miles from Earth, everything seemed to be going 
so well. As a matter of fact, that was past what is called the point of no return. Prior to that point, they could have readjusted their calculations and just shot right back to earth. But now they'd passed the point of no return where they logged into their computers and everything, go to the moon. They couldn't turn back. It was going so well that there was a, uh, one of the uh, communicators in Houston, Texas said, the spacecraft is in really good shape as far as we are concerned. We're bored to tears down here. Just 10 minutes later, the astronauts in that space capsule had just wrapped up a television program that was being shot back to Earth that showed how they were doing working in weightlessness. And they closed that down by saying this, this is the crew of Apollo 11, wishing everybody there a nice evening, and we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back to our pleasant evening in Odyssey. Good night. Nine minutes later, oxygen tank number two exploded, damaging oxygen tank number one, and all of a sudden, everything that was going so smooth, just past the point of no return, turned into a very complicated thing, because now they were committed to going to their destination, but they knew they would never finish that project. Now, everything was, how do we get them back to Earth safely? Swigert. One of the astronauts sent this message back to Houston, Texas. Houston, we've had a problem here. And that set everything in motion. That caused them to think about how to creatively reconstruct everything so that they could get back to Earth safely. They had to rewrite completely new procedures. They did them in three hours what would have taken them three months to do. And the first concern was to determine whether there were enough consumables on board to get them home safely. Power was a concern because with all of that breach, it, it affected the power in the capsule, including heat. So they had to adjust their power. Water was a concern. They didn't have enough water to get back home safely and continue to take the required amounts of water. Removal of carbon dioxide was a big concern because they didn't have the equipment there to do it. So they pulled out their slide rules. They had no calculator. They didn't have the computers that we had today. They pulled out their slide rules and their pencils and they reconfigured everything and they literally had to figure out how to take a round peg and fit it into a square hole because the canister that would turn this around and take care of that carbon dioxide was not the right shape. So they had to figure out how to do that and to create the round and the square thing. They did it. They used a sock. They used cardboard. They used duct tape. Duct tape will fix anything. And they started to create things just from things that were available that they never thought they would use them for any other purpose than the purpose they were supposed to be used for. Funny how we have the things that we need when we need them, but it takes a little creativity to make them fit. They had to replot their course using the sun as the solid point in the whole solar system. The trip, sleep was almost impossible because it was so cold. And uh, flight controllers, they were worried about how to get them safely back home again. They turned around and they left the main module and went into the lunar module. They called that the, the lifeboat because the main module was the thing that was supposed to get them back. The lunar module was only supposed to last for 40 hours, but now they had to make that last much longer than they ever expected to. Long story short, splashdown. Five days later, and over 600,000 miles, splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, they made it back safe. The thing that I'm bringing here is that they had all the tools necessary to do this, but it wasn't, it wasn't created for that job. They had to change things around a little bit to make it fit. We're starting to open service back up again. But that's going to require some major adjustment. 
because this is what Brother, uh, Brother Scott, by faith, this is what Governor Scott has said. He has said that we can open up churches again to 25% of approved fire safety occupancy or one person per 200 square feet, whichever encourages physical distancing. Uh, the camera could sweep around the room today and you can see that this is the proper physical distancing that we have right now. Six feet in every direction. That doesn't mean that we can fit a lot of people in this building. Uh, my instruction is that I have to take the square footage of this facility right here. And then, after I get that square footage, take the square footage of the sound and uh, video booth back there, and then take the square footage of the orchestra pit, and then take the square footage of this area right here, and subtract that from the building. And that's what our fire occupancy would be for people. We can't fit a lot of people in here is what I'm trying to say. Now let's complicate that even more. There's a lot of people that want to come back to church service. I'm not sure why they want to come back, to be honest, but they do want to come back. And when they do want to come back, you can see we can put 20 to 25 people in this building. And that's squashing family members together because they can sit closer together without limiting any other space. But the problem is we've got more than 25 people. Let's complicate that a little bit more. Let's talk about people that are 65 years old and over and or those people who have prior medical conditions that could even, treatments that have, uh, could have even uh, lessened your immunodeficiency, your, in, your immunity to things, it's weakened it. We have to be very careful because who knows who is, who has the coronavirus and who doesn't. They could be asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means you have no outward visible manifestations of this virus, but you've got it and it's contagious. We have to think about that. You know what I'm saying? Is this. It's not going to be 100% safe. No matter what we do and the precautions that we take, nothing is going to be 100% except shutting the building down and not coming back anymore. That'll probably be 100%. But we're doing what we need to do to bring people back in. I believe that we do need to congregate together. But we need to do it safely, and we need to do it within governmental regulation. They are watching out for us, too. And so far, they haven't been overly uh, critical of the church. They haven't overemphasized the church to do things that are more or less than anybody else. They've included us right along with everybody. We're people. And I don't see any governmental regulation that's stopping us from meeting. They're trying to get us back together again safely. So. I want you to just follow along with me because this is what is expected. Prior to anybody coming back in, I have to send a letter out to all of our members and tell them, these are the expectations. Read them, understand them, sign it. And then you have to send that back to me, stating that you realize that this could be a risky situation and you're willing to take the risk. Then we would have an usher outside of the door who has mask and gloves on. He'll open and close the door. We only need to clean that doorknob one time, or two times, before service and after. We'll have another one standing in the foyer that will open the door and close it as needed, and they will also make sure that everybody that goes into the bathroom cleans the bathroom before they leave. And they have to be wearing personal protective equipment too. That means that if mom and dad, who normally just send their kids to the bathroom 300 times, and they never make it there because I've seen them wandering around in the vestibule, but uh, if they send their kid back there to go to the bathroom, they have to make sure that their kid wash their hands and put on some hand sanitizer and put on their little gloves, which I'm working on, and then they need to inspect the bathroom to make sure it's clean. It's more complicated than it was. And then when we gather together, you have to come to your seat, and that's where you're going to be. 
then we have to allow everybody out in an orderly fashion. Nobody can be congregating by the door. You're not standing face to face. And it's going to go something like this. When service is over, we've, we've uh, played the music, we've sang our song. Then I'm just going to come down and I'm going to sit on the edge of the platform and we're going to fellowship in place. It's not going to be like it used to be. It can't and keep you safe. Well, we have another complication. If we have over 60 people coming to this church congregation and they're of different ages and different health status, then we have to be thinking about who's going to come in and when they're going to come in. So here's what we're thinking. We'll have several services on Sunday. And then our services normally last about an hour right now. When more people come in, it's going to encourage a little bit more participation. Service may go a little bit longer. But we're going to have to have the service, then I'm going to sit down and have a howdy session with you, and then you're going to leave, and then we're going to have to clean the church all over again. And then another group will come in, and we will sit down, and uh, everybody sing and praise God. We'll do our, our sermon, and then we'll sit down again and say, how you doing? How's everything going with you? Everything all right? Let's complicate it even further. The first group in should be the ones that could be immunodeficiency compromised. They could be compromised. Their health is at concern, as a big concern. So they would probably come in first. Well, there's a problem, because you may not be coming in with the people you want to come in with. Tough. We're going to do what we can do. And then the next group, you may come in and you may not be with the people you want to be with. Can't help you. We're trying to do our best. Well, there may be a family gathering where families will have to sit together, all of them, because it's going to take up other space. So you have to sit together. Couples, they can sit closer together, but it's going to take up more space is what I'm saying. So we've got to figure all this out. Uh, I just contacted my brother-in-law yesterday who uh, owns Empire Janitorial Supply, and he's, he's trying to fix us up with some things that will help us to keep this building clean and safe and sterilized. But it's going to be a work in progress. I'm going to have ServPro or, or Service Master or, or something like that come in, and they're going to clean this whole building. And they're going to clean the chairs, and they're going to clean the carpet, and they're going to disinfect things. And then after that, we're responsible for keeping it up to date. We've never gone this way before, but I'm willing to step into it and figure out, God, what are you doing? What in the world are you doing in all of this? In other places in the country, I'm getting some reports that there are other people who are homebound just like we are. But people are being baptized in Jesus' name and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Even in isolation, they're still finding a way to go out and pursue the great commission of Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, I don't know of anybody that's come into the church. I've known a few people that have left, but I haven't known anybody coming into the church. And I'm thinking, we're missing something here. We're missing an opportunity. We think that we've got to come back into the building before we can accomplish the great commission of Jesus Christ. And that's just not true. We can reach out to people even in this compromised situation. We can still reach out to them. Some of you are watching that have never been in this building. Some of you, I'm just saying, if you don't belong to a church, I'm more than happy to communicate with you and teach you what you need to know. We can still do the Great Commission. Now, that Great Commission has just been brought into this. Let's, let's talk about that for a moment or two. When we all come back together again, this is just us. I'm not inviting visitors in because I have no way of knowing who that visitor would be, and I can't check them out first. But you can. If you're going to bring a visitor in when it comes time, you need to make sure that they're safe. You need to make sure that they're okay. Incidentally, if you're watching this, and you've got a key to this building, and you come in and out of here during the week, and you're bringing visitors with you, don't do that anymore. Because I have no idea 
if they are compromised or not. So, if you want to walk in and out of this door, do so. Clean the door handles when you leave. Clean everything that you've touched when you've been in here. Leave. Clean the, the lock. But don't bring anybody else in with you that, doesn't, that is not a member of this church congregation. I can't vet them. I can't check them out. So, what do we do? Well, we gather together as the church in our different groups. And then we still have the problem of how to accomplish the great commission of Jesus Christ. This will just be for us. So it's not going to be like bringing a lot of people in here and seeing them enter into the church this way. It's got to be different. I talked to Brother Kuzno this week, and I, I asked him, I said, you know, uh, Bible, home Bible studies used to be the soul-winning tool of our churches, and it worked. But somewhere along the line, they just left. And now... We wait for people to come into the church and then teach them a Bible study. But we don't teach in their home. We bring them to a location and teach them from there. And I'm thinking, what a, what a missed opportunity. Maybe we should just talk about home Bible studies again. Like, you could meet with them at a safe distance, taking your precautions, Minister to them a Bible study outside of the church building. What a novel concept. They could hear the word of God outside the church building. That means that you have to get to work. That doesn't mean that Brother Kuzno or Brother Zider or myself or somebody else standing up here is going to feed them the word. It means you're going to feed them the word now. And I found out you can do that on Facebook you can even get the word of God across on Facebook. Imagine that. Out of all your 400,000 friends, you could actually give a Bible study on Facebook or Skype or whatever the case may be. Zoom. Zoom into their home and give them a Bible study. I'm thinking we've got to be creative because we've never done this before. Brother Cousin and I were just talking about that this week. This has never been done before. Churches have never had to do this as long as we've been alive. We're in a unique situation, and they're starting to loosen the restrictions a little bit, and I'm thinking, God, I don't think we've learned what we were supposed to learn in this situation. So I don't think this whole thing is just going to open up overnight. Even if we can have 50% of the capacity of the building, it doesn't change the amount of people we can come in here at one time. I'm in a predicament. So are you. But just like Abram, just like the Apollo 13 astronauts, I'll show you what you need to do. We'll get you to touch down safely. But you've just got to use the materials you have now in order to do it. What do we have? We're still going to live stream. That's something that we have. We're trying to perfect the video process we're working on the audio process still. I know Ronnie King's going to be back there in his chair. Hi, Ronnie. And he's going to be uh, texting information and different things. This should have gone up. That should have gone down. And he's, he's still on the job, even though he, he can't be in this building. He's still in the building. Elvis is in the building. We don't know what else is going to come down the road. I have no idea. But I do know that the commission of Jesus Christ still needs to go on no matter what. I believe God's saying, I will show you if you will just get into this. Move into it by faith. And then I will speak to you. And I will tell you what I'm going to do. And then you can't stop. You've got to take the next step. And then God will talk to you there. And then take the next, and the next, and the next. I'm not telling you to go way out there. I'm just telling you to take the next step. And I will show you. We need to trust God. We need to trust God. We need to trust God. Social distancing requirements are still in place. I'm going to contact the fire marshal and give him all our dimensions and everything. I'll let you know all about that. And those of you who are viewing and you're not a member of this church, I'm sorry you're having to go through this, but these are expectations. 
and we're going to do the best that we can. And hopefully we'll see you face to face sometime in the near future. I hope that this has been enlightening. Because the next step is to get this place safe. Then to bring in people. And I know you're going to have your own way of doing this. I'm going to disappoint you right now. It's not your way. Like I said Thursday, if you viewed Thursday, you'll know what I'm talking about. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has their own way of doing things. But it's really not your way. It's God's way. And I'm trying to be sensitive to hearing from the voice of the Lord. I will show you. Then it's up to you to make the distinction as to whether or not I've heard from God. And if I have heard from God, then you're kind of obligated to join along or join somewhere else. I would just as soon have you join with me. The other thing that I'm bringing across, and I'm bringing this across to a lot of people, and I'll have conversations with you one day. But I've been talking to the leadership of our church, and it's going to continue to go that, that route, leadership down. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is this for the good of all the people, or is it just what you want to do? Is it just for what you want to do, or is it just for what you and a certain select group of people want to do? It's not the way God leads his church. It's for the good of everybody. So sermons and lessons that I do, they may not make you feel good, but I believe it's where God wants me to lead you. And I'm trying to make decisions that are going to benefit everybody. So if I ask you to please join this group, please join this group. If I say you need to join the third group, then please work with me. Let's join the third group. If I say families need to sit together, then families need to sit together. And if couples come into the church and they hate each other's guts when they walk in the door, they're going to have to sit together. Yeah, this is really going to help you. It's going to build up my marriage and family practice, and I'm going to have so many problems, I'll see Dr. Cousineau, and uh, he'll shrink me back to reality. And if you believe that, all come back together again at one time. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for putting up with me for a few minutes. I hope that something that's been said or done or songs and music that have been played has really ministered to you today because we are stepping into another time of this whole virus thing that's a, it's just a, a big question mark to begin with. But now that it's coming back together, it's going to come together slower than it did getting apart. And we're going to have to really walk in here and find out, God, what are you trying to tell me right now? God, why are we even doing this? Is there a reason? Well, we need the fellowship. That's one thing. But also, if you believe Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, we're obligated to keep an eye on each other and see if we're doing okay. And you can't do that separate. So there's going to be more than one reason. So if you come back together in whatever group you're in, and you find somebody just looking at you like this. They may be mad at you, that's one thing. Or they may be just, are you okay? I'm watching you, I haven't seen you in a long time. Are you all right? Because I'm sensing something here. You need to tell me whether I'm right or wrong. And then let's six foot distance pray for each other. I'm not sure how we're going to anoint people with oil. I thought of a squirt gun. That might work. Or a super soaker and then just saying a prayer. But we're, we're going to figure this thing out. We've never done this before. We are a generation of pioneers. So if you have something that you think would work, talk to me. But I think I know the direction we're going in, but I'm not sure what it's going to look like when everything's said and done. But I do know this. God will show me. He will show me. God bless you today. All right, let's find a place to pray and pray about what we have heard today. Water you've turned into wine. Oh,
Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together, whether we've been the few that have gathered here in the building to provide this live stream or whoever is listening uh, to this live stream broadcast. We thank you for everyone that has tuned in today and to hear from the word of the Lord, hear the vision of the pastor, join us in worship. Lord, we ask your blessing upon those that we cannot see but we know are watching and listening, we ask that you would keep them and that you would stir their hearts and that you would stir the hearts of your church in ways to reach out and to use this opportunity as an opportunity for ministry. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. We thank you for having tuned into the service today. Remember to send your uh, attendance in if you've uh, been listening to AC Church Vermont at gmail.com. I think that's also been up on the screen. And uh, you can also uh, give your tithe and offering uh, via mail, uh, the church address, or you can go to Tithely, uh, which is uh, there's a link on the church website for that as well. So again, we appreciate you uh, coming today, and uh, we ask 
that you would continue to support us as we try to figure out what is going on through all of this COVID stuff. God bless you.